Okay, uh, welcome back. So one uh, announcement that after this uh, lecture we will have uh, the group photo. So please uh, come and come to the to the picture. Um, so we have uh, a new course, uh, the one on uh, reionization, and uh, the speaker is Salim Zarubi. Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks for the invitation to give these talks. I um, I realize that I'm one of the last uh, speakers in this series and you are really tired, so I'll try to be uh, as entertaining as I can, given the topic. Uh, uh, I, will, uh, I will go mostly, I mean, my plan in this is uh, to give you a flavor of everything, not to go into details too much, uh, because otherwise you uh, will get lost in details, maybe. Um, I will start with a very kind of sketchy way of describing the first uh, stars. I mean, what is this epoch, how we understand it? And, uh, and um, a little bit of theory. Our theory is mostly uh, simulations in these days. Um, uh, and then uh, move from that to observational probes of reionization. And uh, uh, the, the, the focus of uh, the second, or probably the, the last lecture, will be the 21 centimeter uh, probe, which is this very exciting probe. And that's one of my expertise is. Um, OK. So I'm sure you have seen this uh, picture many times. Uh, this is the history of the universe. This is one of these renditions. I think this appeared in Science Magazine, and I like this one specifically because it has so much details, but it doesn't different, it's not different from the other uh, kind of images of this. Uh, this is the universe uh, history as we understand it. This is the Big Bang, or, you know, kind of the, 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 the and, and their inflation happens. The, and this is the CMB, the last scattering surface. For my purposes, before the CMB, everything was opaque and ionized, right? So that's, that's, my, uh, that's why I show this. Uh, and uh, so the CMB, you had a uh, separate uh, a number of lectures on it. Uh, uh, this is, we know incredibly well, the wealth of information from the CMB is unbelievable. If you started when I started in this field, uh, I, when I was a student, when I started, CMB fluctuations were not discovered yet, right? I'm that old. Um, uh, and uh, in 92, Kobe came up with the fluctuations, and all what we knew about was the amplitude of the fluctuations. There were many, many, many papers, but the only real information in the Kobe papers, which are many, uh, uh, is, is, the, is the scale of the fluctuations. And then other, other experiments came, came by and showed us, showed us this incredible detail. It's, uh, it's the gift that keeps giving and will be giving for a while, so CMB is very exciting. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, the CMB is when the universe became, uh, it's the last scattering surface, the re decoupling and recombination, that's when things became neutral. Hydrogen became neutral, rough, you know, at most. There's still some small fraction of, uh, of, uh, of ionized stuff. Uh, uh, if, you, if, you were, if we were to live there, then, the CMB, if humans were there and they would look at the CMB, the CMB is about, you remember what's the CMB uh, the temperature now? It's about 2.73 Kelvin. This is redshift roughly 1100, 1200. So we are talking about something of, 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 of about 3000 degrees temperature. It's kind of reddish, right? So if, if we were alive then, you will see the universe, it has a color, it will have a color of red, right? That's, uh, it's like, uh, just something that helped me at least understand the CMB. The CMB, if you want to think about the CMB, it's like the inverted sun. The sun, we see only the, 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 last, the chromosphere, the last stuff that releases photons. Everything inside is like the early universe, right? All what we see is this crust of the hot initial phase of the universe. And it's very similar in terms of physics. This is Thomson scattering, so it's not very complicated. Anyways, after this phase, the universe keeps expanding, and of course, this color of 3,000 degrees redshifts a little bit more and a little bit more until it goes, until it goes out of the optical, right? Uh, it becomes infrared, and then we stop seeing it if we were alive then. That's why this phase was the dark ages, because if we were alive, we'd see it dark, right? There's nothing. Of course, there, at this stage, there are no stars, no galaxies, immediately after, after the last scattering surface. And the universe becomes a very boring thing. There's nothing except the gas that is adiabatically evolving and, and cooling. 
Uh, this is not completely true because the fluctuations that were seeded by inflation uh, have time to grow due through gravitational instabilities. And at some stage, these things become so nonlinear that they start forming galaxies and, and uh, stars, first stars and galaxies. Uh, and those will, will uh, emit UV radiation uh, either in their first generation or second generation of stars, and they start ionizing their surrounding. And the universe will become ionized again. And this phase starts here. Uh, so if you remember, this is when the universe was 400,000 years old, roughly, 378,000 years old. This starts when the universe is half a billion years old. So there's, there's about a, a, a time fraction of 1,000, roughly, in terms, of, uh, in terms of this evolution. And, and this basically plunges the universe in this one of the last phase transition in it, where the gas goes from neutral to, hydrogen, uh, to, to, uh, to ionized. This is the epoch of ionization. Uh, it's a global phase transition. It's interesting for cosmologists because it's a global phase transition. It talks about the universe as a big thing. It's interesting, it's interesting, it is interesting for astro astrophysicists because this is where astrophysical objects started. This is when galaxies started and, 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 and stars started. So it's a significant event in many, in many ways. In, in other words, this is when baryons became very important in the evolution and producing things. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting uh, epoch. And the universe before it and after it goes from the unfamiliar to the familiar. The universe before it that doesn't have so many galaxies. It's just something that is very weird. After it, it becomes having galaxies and stars. It becomes familiar to us. It's like the universe now. Of course, not exactly, but, but in rough terms. Uh, now, uh, so this is in terms of the, why this is interesting. The other reason why this is interesting is that we observe low redshift stuff very well. We have telescopes that go very, uh, you know, up to redshift six, re relatively routinely. But after this redshift, this is roughly redshift six, uh, and I will come to that in detail. After this redshift, uh, it's hard to, uh, for our telescopes to go there. Uh, there. There's some data now, which has been a very exciting development in the last uh, number of years, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of a slow progress. Uh, the next piece of information after Richard 6, we have Richard 1100. So there's this huge lack of uh, information about a, a, a big chunk of the evolution of the universe, uh, which we would like to understand, to put everything in, in, in kind of, to tie the picture in a very coherent and, and systematic way. Okay, so this is my story. If you don't take anything from my talk, take this one, and that, that will be basically enough to give you the, the, the flavor or, or the big idea. Of course, there's lots of details, and I will lie to you if I'll say that we understand everything. We almost don't understand anything in, the, in this, but we have lots of speculations, lots of, uh, because of the lack of data. But this is changing, this is changing a lot, and uh, uh, I'll try to convince you that uh, we are starting to understand what's happening, and in the future we'll understand much more, given the excitement of new, new projects. Uh, I, I'm very formal in my way of talking, so if you have a question, if you have anything that I say that is not clear, or uh, please, please stop me and ask. Okay, so we start with the sources of ionization, and uh, if I would ask you what you, do, you would think the sources of ionization are, the simplest things is the first stars, the galaxies, right? That's, that's the thing that we see around us. This epoch of redshift six, seven, that you will see why I keep mentioning this redshift six, seven, is where galaxies start popping up and we start seeing them. Then uh, they are the, the most kind of uh, normal candidate. Their energy output is huge. They can do this reionization quite easily or relatively easily, uh, etc. However, they are not the only candidate. They are the most favored candidate, and probably they are what ionize the universe, or most of it. Um, it but there are some details which I'll uh, kind of touch upon, more than touch upon, a little bit talk about population two, three versus population two stars, the different types of stars, I'll come to that. Uh, these population three are the primordial stars. They are stars that are made from the primordial mix of gas, which is hydrogen and helium. They don't have metals. Uh, metals for us is anything, you know, kind of heavier than helium, right? So that's, uh, uh, and uh, 
POP2 are, are what we now call POP2. There are old stars around us. At, the, at these times, they were young stars. And, uh, and uh, the, 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 this is the competition. And who ionized the universe? Is this one or this one? Most people think it's this one. It's what makes more normal galaxies. But those have played a, a very important role. They, they came first and then made way to, to the, to the POP2. Pop that will be part of my lecture today. There is also other things like QSOs or faint AGNs, what we call mini quasars. These are sources that are um, uh, fed by, uh, by accretion, direct accretion of, of mass. So there are accretion-dominated sources, and they are not thermal. Stars are thermal normally. They, they follow Planck laws, uh, Planck's law normally. Uh, AGNs and quasars emit things in terms of uh, in, uh, like power laws mostly, right? They are, they are very hard, and they produce hard photons like X-rays. Um, uh, we don't know much about them at high redshifts, but in recently there have been uh, a, a number, we, you know, a number of, of quasars discovered at, at high redshifts, and there is a speculation that maybe the faint quasars are there, mo much more there than, than than we expected, so they might have played a role, although there are limits there. Uh, so I think the consensus is that QSOs and faint uh, AGNs did not ionize the universe, but they played some role, maybe some 10, 20 percent. They play the role in heating. I'll come to that hopefully in the second or third part of my, my lectures. Uh, uh, there's also X-ray binaries, which is are also kind of uh, um, um, uh, something that people consider. Uh, but there are more exotic things like dark matter annihilation and uh, more exotic scenarios like primordial black holes and stuff like this. Um, uh, these are, I will not touch upon these things too much. Uh, but again, the consensus is that they don't contribute much. If they are there, we can use ionization if we understand it very well and see the history very well. We can understand it. Uh, we can use it to constrain these, these processes, but not the other way around. So, so I'll focus on the conventional pictures, but this is to mention that there are other things. Now, uh, so let, let's start with the first stars. Uh, this is a big topic. And it's mostly, mostly done with high, high-resolution simulations. Uh, and uh, I will not plunge into it too much, but I'll give you the basic physics of it, yeah? just to give you the flavor of why, why is it different than... Uh, so, so the first generation of stars is formed with a primordial mix of gas. And the primordial mix of gas had only hydrogen and helium, a bit of lithium, but that's almost negligible, but it's, it's hydrogen and helium. Can anybody tell me, if you are not in the field, don't answer this question, yeah? Why, uh, why, is, why is it unusual to, I mean, why this is different from a normal star? That, that a star that has hydrogen and helium alone will be different than a sol the sun? Does anybody know? Yes? For, for, uh, for, for the producing the heat in the side of the sun, that's the CNO. Well, that's, that's true, but most the, 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 the dominant thing is, is, the, is the hydrogen burning. That's, it's not in the, yes. They are big in size as a consequence of the physical reason. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm. Right. Yeah. So that's the right answer. I'll explain it in detail. So when you, the way things, if stars form, or any kind of these gravitational systems work, form at the end to form something that is baryonic at the center, uh, you start with gravitational instability, things collapse. But at some stage, if you have baryons, things heat up because you push everything to the center. Once things heat up, pressure prevents things from kind of things collapsing more. That's what happens in galaxy clusters. Galaxy clusters, actually, uh, the gas is, is distributed almost as much as the dark matter. Actually, dark matter is a little bit more concentrated than gas in these systems. Uh, so in order to form things more, to have, to have things condense more, the gas has to lose its energy. And the way gas loses its energy is by, in, in astronomy, more, in most processes, is there are a number of processes, but the dominant one normally is radiative cooling, which means if you have a quantum system at an atom, it gets excited from the heating to higher energy levels, and then it's, it gets de-excited. 
When it's de-excited, it emits a photon that can run away from the system. This is the cooling. So you lose energy by this radiative cooling process. In primordial mix, when you have only hydrogen and helium, and here hydrogen is the more important one, the first level of excitation is Lyman alpha. Lyman alpha is 10.2 electron volts, 10.4, 10.2, I think, electron volt. If you translate that to a mass, if you ask what halo, when things collapse, they, they heat up. So what mass of a halo that would collapse will get to that temperature, 10 to the 4, it will be huge. It will be 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10 solar masses, or 10 to the 9 solar masses. That's a very big mass to have before starting forming stars. I'll go into that in detail, but the point is that early in the universe, there were not so many of those very big halos. There was not enough time to accumulate so much mass to heat up these things so, so quickly. So that's why forming these things is very hard. It's not easy. Whereas if you have a little bit of metals, tiny bit, they have different energy levels, much, much lower. And through these channels, energy can escape quite easily. So radiative cooling is way much more efficient. You only need one in a thousand to become a normal star. So these stars, if they form, the expectation, at least the initial expectation, was they will be huge because they, 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 their, their cooling process is very, is very hard. So that's the reason first stars are different than normal stars. OK? So this is the cooling issue. There is another issue. Now, let us, let's assume that uh, you manage to get a mass that is collapsing and cooling efficiently. How from that you would form a star? This is gas that is kind of uh, contracting. How from that you will form a star? Then there's lots of gas. And the competition then is, is as follows. It's, it is between the collapse time of the halo, right? If the collapse time is very fast, it leaves very little room to other things to do stuff. But if the collapse time is very long, then uh, compared... Uh, long and, and short, always, always in comparative terms, almost in, always in comparative terms, relative to the local cooling. So if you have a gas that is uh, contracting, and here you have a, a parcel of gas that is cooling very quickly. So what will happen in this one, in this very small parcel, it will cool down and it will condensate faster than the rest of the gas that is collapsing. This is how you fragment stuff, right? And if you go through it, I mean, that's the theory in rough terms, uh, you should get star masses that, like that we observe in our surrounding. So it's a competition between the collapse of the big halo and the, fragmented, the cooling time that fragments stuff locally. If the cooling time is shorter, you will fragment to smaller pieces. If the, if the cooling time is large, you will not fragment to smaller pieces. The problem of these systems, if you have hydrogen alone, atomic hydrogen, the, f the cooling time is not very efficient. Why? And unless you get to these very, very big masses. So if you produce stars there, it will be huge. And people started talking at the beginning at 1,000 solar mass black, uh, uh, star or hundreds of solar mass stars. Now it's different. I'll, I'll, come, I'll come to it. Uh, so so f pure atomic hydrogen, I didn't mention helium so much, but hydrogen dominates everything here. Pure atomic hydrogen has a problem. It's very hard to understand how things would form. And I'll go through details a little bit to clarify this picture. Uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what, well, at the end, what does it to the rest of the IGM, especially in terms of population two stars. OK. So this is the cartoon. You start from an overdensity. And uh, at, the, at the beginning, and then dense thing becomes denser. This is gravitational instability. And then when once thing becomes very, very peaky, they go nonlinear and form galaxies. So that's the, uh, the, the initial picture. And even in nature, the, gets, the rich gets poorer, richer and the poor gets poorer. That's uh, kind of, uh, it seems like uh, uh, everything is unfair in the world. Uh, ah, that's not working. No, it's working. So this is the cartoon that I was, that I was talking about. If you, this is the, uh, uh, this, this, it's this uh, kind of uh, cloud that is, that is collapsing. And as it collapses, 
it, uh, it uh, heats up, and then you need to radiate this heat up to get more condensation, and then fragment to form stars, right? So these are the three things that we have, three or four things that we have to worry about. Uh, to work these things in detail, that's, that's difficult because you have to go f over many, many scales. So to, uh, to simulate something like this, you have to start from cosmological scales to down to uh, large scale structure uh, things, down to galaxies, down to the stellar scales, and these are hum and down to even more. So that's a huge range of scales. So to simulate this thing was not easy. So the first, uh, the first uh, set of simulations was a, a, big, a big achievement. Uh, so this is the picture. Now, I was uh, counting on the fact that you will learn something about press sector, but you haven't in this, in this course so far. They have? Oh, excellent, excellent. So, so you, have, you have heard about the press sector. So this is, uh, so this is taken from this review in, 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 from Barkanai and Loeb, uh, where, so here what you see is the mass in terms of solar masses versus the, the, the mass fraction in halos. And, and, and you can see that, uh, you know, so that's the mass fraction per, per uh, megaparsecs cubed. Uh, and you can see that uh, big masses like, like uh, so this is redshift, sorry, so this is redshift zero here, and this is redshift 30, I think, that's the, that's the, and uh, you can see that at high redshifts, these are the high redshifts ones, you don't have large masses of halos. So m most halos at, at the beginning, at high redshifts, are small, too small to make, to cool hydrogen, right? That's the argument of the cooling before. Uh, actually, this looks like most, initially you would see that most of the mass is in these small halos because you have so many of them, but uh, that's misleading. Actually, most of the mass is at the break, right? That's the press sector kind of, uh, uh, so there is M star, which you have defined, I hope the typical mass at, some, at, at, at a certain redshift, most of the dominant mass at any redshift is that M star. Although smaller masses will be much more abundant. There will be much more, many more of them, but the big ones are the ones that matter in terms of mass, okay? So this is the point I was trying to make, that at high redshifts, you don't have enough mass to cool, to, to form uh, halos that have temperature of 10 to the 4 uh, Kelvin. So this is another... Uh, this is another kind of, uh, it's the same kind of uh, work done differently. Uh, so this is, the, again, that's mass as a function of redshift. This is, uh, for a standard model, this is the one sigma, two sigma, three sigma fluctuations. Let's focus on the one sigma. This says that at redshift 10, uh, you will have masses uh, of order, uh, the dominant one will be 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 2, and anyways, you will have these very big masses, 10 to the 10 to the 12, only at very small redshifts, right? Uh, at, at, uh, at 2 and 3 sigma fluctuations, you will get more. Here, there are two lines. Ignore this for the time being. I'll come to back to it later. This is the, the, the atomic cooling line. So this is below which, below this, there is no atomic cooling that is efficient. And you can see that you form very little mass that, that is cooled enough to form these uh, stars with each one. Uh, this is the temperature. Again, here you have two lines. I don't know if you can see them. This in cyan. From here I can, but I don't know from the back. It's from the paper itself. Sorry about the color. I couldn't change it uh, in time. Uh, and so you can translate mass to virial temperature, just energy considerations. And this is that 10 to the 4 solar mass, 10 to the 4 Kelvin. That's when H1 cools, and, and you can get this Lyman alpha cooling. I'll let, let you ask in a second. Uh, so this is it. Again, below this, there is no efficient cooling. Above this, there's no, there's efficient cooling. And you can see that if you consider the one sigma thing, the ionization should happen, or sources or galaxies should all form at, at very low redshifts. So this cannot be the story. So there must be something else. Yes? This is, oh, um, this is, no, no, this is from theoretical kind of grounds. So, I mean, it's the press sector formalism, so you assume that the universe is Gaussian, and you assume that things above a certain threshold in fluctuations can, you know, can go nonlinear. 
Hey, come again? No, no, I'll, 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 I'll show you where it comes from. It's from uh, simulating the cool, simulating. It's from calculating the cooling times uh, function. I will come to the cooling function. There's a cooling. It's a very long calculation, but it's a calculation, not a simulation or something. I cannot, I cannot hear. Ah, right, this one. This is mass fraction in megaparsecs. So it's one over megaparsecs. It's number, number density, if you see, with, if you want, with different, with certain mass, mass, halo masses. Okay? Okay. Now I come to the cooling rates. So the cooling rate is, this is the famous kind of function. So the cooling rate of H1, a star that has, or a cloud that has only helium, uh, hydrogen, is this, is this uh, red thing. And you can see it has a wall here uh, at around 10 to the 4. This is the Lyman alpha cooling. This is things going to the first excited state and going down. Right? And you can see that it doesn't cool below 10 to the 4. Come back. This is where 10 to the 4 is. And 10 to the 4 basically corresponds to very massive stuff. So you have to wait until very massive stuff comes so that yeah, you can cool. But then something else comes to the rescue, and this is kind of has been the breakthrough in the last 10, 12 years, is that it's true that we only have hydrogen and helium, but hydrogen in certain conditions can go from atomic to molecular. Hydrogen prefers the molecular kind of phase in normal circumstances. In very early universe, that's not the case, but, but you know, in high densities that would happen. Some fraction of it will become uh, molecular. And molecular hydrogen is different than, than atomic hydrogen. Why? Because molecules have vibrational and rotational modes. They have much lower energy transitions. Therefore, I can cool much easier than this jump, this huge jump. This is, I think, assumes that one in a thousand of the hydrogen gas is in, in a molecular phase. And you can see that the temperature drops from 10,000 to a few hundred couple of hundred. So I can cool things with halos that are a couple of hundred. And that, if I go back, these are these lines. So before, with the H1, I could also see, I could only kind of form galaxies with these very, very, you know, kind of hot things, or here, very massive things. But with H2, I can go now to halos with, of order 10 to the 6, 10 to the 8 solar masses, which are kind of much more abundant at these high redshifts. Okay? So that's the physical picture. That's why this is very important. Now, to calculate, yes. Come again? Yes. That's the, that's the H1 cooling rate. If you only have, H1 is hydrogen, atomic hydrogen. That's what I mean, right? The blue dashed line is when you have uh, uh, H2, molecular, molecular, not well, the astronomy is confusing. Well, now you have molecular hydrogen, okay? H2 with that real two, not Roman two, yeah? So, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so that's what saves you. So that drops your cooling from this, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the, which means that much smaller halos can now cool and fragment and collapse, okay? More questions? That? Yes. Uh, yeah, but I mean, this is the it's, the cooling curve is kind of there's a range of energies that that it, it's efficient, more efficient here, but it has a sufficient tail at lower energies. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Why is it? Because it has these uh, vibrational and rotational. So, uh, so you don't need to push uh, an electron to the Lyman alpha. The fact that the two do this can absorb some of the energy and then emit it as the, in uh, photons that are related to that uh, transition, which is much, much smaller energy. Yeah? So you can do it much easier. Actually, this is what we see in local star formation. Stars locally form in molecular clouds, what we call. You need molecules to do that. And that's the reason it's easier to do things with molecules. 
So this is one of the, not the earliest paper, but this is one of the pioneers, a paper by one of the pioneers, uh, Volker Brom. I mean, the, f the first people to, to calculate this is, is Brom and um, Volker Brom and his, and his collaborator and uh, Tom Abel and his collaborator. Uh, and they often produce these things. And this gives you the, the scale of the issue, why this is so complicated to simulate. So you start from 300 parsecs. Actually, you should start from tens of megaparsecs. But then you zoom on to 5 parsecs, 25 solar radio, and then 10 AU astronomical units. This is a huge resolution. And to do this, this is an achievement. And the, the way they did it mostly is with AMR, the adaptive mystery time refinement uh, kind of techniques. But uh, I think those guys use mostly gadget. So there are a few, few ways to do this. And you can see that you start from a cloud when you kind of uh, uh, go down and down and down. You can actually see the accretion the accretion phase that builds up the mass at the, central, at the central point. Here, we don't have more resolution, as you can see, but here, clearly, there is a center, and there's an accretion phase, and even kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 what do you call, uh, tidal uh, uh, spiral, spiral arms, kind of. Uh, uh, and where, where the star forms, that's also, also another issue. So the, the old picture was the, the initial stars form at the center. There is a study that I'll show in a second that shows maybe the stars not form in the center, but in these, in these, in these uh, waves of gravitational kind of uh, arms, where you have higher density and then you have more probability to do stuff. And the difference is that if you form things here, then the mass will be large. If you form things here, the mass of the stars will be smaller. Uh, so th that's, the, that's the difference. So this is a, a, a study in the same year. Here you see one star forming at the center, here you see this fragmentation in these, in these spiral arms. Uh, why, why, why people do this? Because we want an idea how massive are the first objects, right? So I gave you this hand-waving physical argument, but there's lots of more details. Uh, there's things that have to do with turbulence, with, uh, with angular momentum, with magnetic fields, which nobody touches, of course. That's, that's too difficult to, to, do, to do. So there's lots of details on top of the cosmological kind of simulations that you need to do, the hydrodynamical simulation, to, to reach these resolutions. So there's, the groups don't necessarily kind of agree, but they do these things to have an estimate of what is the mass of the initial stars. We thought at the beginning of this field that there will be, I don't know, 100 solar masses, 50 solar masses. If these fragmentations are correct, we can get down to 10 solar masses. It becomes much easier to make them. Right? And that's, that. so there is no consensus yet, as far as I know, about what is the right answer, because again, this is complicated stuff, but, but people are doing this, and it's a very interesting field. Um, and it's incredibly exciting, actually, to do this, and lots of physics, lots of other things. Uh, what, can these things form, for instance, black holes early on? So that's another kind of thing that I'm not touching on. Uh, but the, the frustrating thing, thing about these things, as much as you would like to uh, simulate them and, and, and see them in simulations, we, we probably will never be able to see them directly because they are really at the center of these. Uh, of these. Uh, we don't have the resolution to see something like this at Redshift 10, 11, 15, or 20. This is kind of what we'll never have in the future. So we'll have their collective effect, but not individual effect. Some of the issues we'll have to see to, sort, to kind of sort out indirectly. Okay, so um, to uh, summarize this and put the steps that, uh, in terms of the further uh, evolution. So uh, the, the population three stars are expected to have masses. Now we think it's 10 to 100. How much at the high end, how much at the low end? There's lots of debate, but this is the range. Just to give you a number, a, sol a, a star with 20 solar masses would live for, anybody knows how much, what's the, lo the lifetime of a star with 20, 20 solar masses? Any guess? Hmm? One million. One million year. That's it. So it's very short. We're talking about billions of years, right? It's very short. So they live and die very quickly, right? So. So that's one thing. The other thing is that if that's their range of masses, uh, 10 to 20, 10 to 100, we will never see them now. 
because they will be dead long, 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 long ago, right? Now the universe is full of metals, it's contaminated, all of that stuff. Right, why they are important? So do, uh, do they ionize the universe by themselves? They are, live very, they are massive. In their life, they produce a lot of UV. There's, I mean, massive stars produce UV normally, ultraviolet radiation. Uh, ultraviolet radiation, uh, they, uh, then they explode, they contaminate the, the, the IGM, etc. But because of their short time life, nobody expects them to ionize the universe by their own. Their importance, actually, we think, there's some kind of discussion, is the fact that they contaminate and there's feedback effects from them that contaminates the rest of the universe. Uh, the, the, the feedback and contamination gives rise to population two stars. Because when they explode these things after a million years, in their centers, they have produced new atoms now, right? New nuclear. And these have, they are not helium and hydrogen anymore. You'll have more things like carbon and other things. And those are very easy uh, to cool. And they form much, much smaller stars, the ones that we are used to. OK? Uh, uh, and those population two stars, which don't have too much metals, but they have metals, they produce lots of UV. Their numbers are large. The masses that, of the galaxies that they kind of, the number of galaxies that they can form on is now much larger because they don't have to form in the highest peaks. They can form in the lower peak. And those can ionize the universe. So this is the picture we have. Uh, now, they do something else. They produce Lyman-Werner photons. Lyman, for, you, for those of you who don't know what Lyman-Werner photons, these are photons in the band between 10.2 electron volt and 13.6 electron volt. So this is between the Lyman alpha and hydrogen and the continuum. And those, if you have them, they will, they will uh, destroy molecular hydrogen. So once they produce them, the smaller halos that didn't produce anything before and they, they were going to produce uh, population three stars, cannot do it anymore. Why? Because this radiation prevents the formation of molecular hydrogen. So this is, this is a very, uh, you know, kind of complicated process. And it's point, I mean, it depends where you are in the, in the, in the density field, but, uh, but this is it. And they finally, uh, after all of this process, which is, this is very schematic. This is oversimplified. I, I kind of emphasize this. There's lots of details, lots of work here that can be. Uh, this finally creates stable galaxies uh, where their virial temperature is 10 to the 4 and, and uh, something like that. Yes, please. Uh, high density, basically. There is, there's a process, uh, if you ionize, I mean, it's, it's kind of, uh, so the, they can form through a channel of ionization. So you ionize and then, uh, so I didn't want to go to these details. There's a kind of schemes of how things can go. So you ionize one hydrogen, and this ionized hydrogen kind of sticks to another neutral hydrogen, and th that's how you form it. But it needs high densities, and it needs normal temperatures, not, not completely. So there is lots of uh, conditions. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm trying not to go in too much into details. I mean. I hope that's the right decision. I'm not sure. OK. So I'll show you a movie now, but I would like to ask uh, uh, people to uh, turn, on the, turn off the, the light. Oh, thanks, uh, Paolo. So this is, finally, after all of this, we have normal galaxies, kind of. And the question is how these normal galaxies ionize the universe. This is a simulation that was done by Marcelo Alvarez, and I think Tom Abel was involved. Uh, this is God's view here in, in the sense that if you stand outside the universe and look at it from outside, how will you see the process of reionization happening, right? Uh, so you see here, above, there's, there's a cube here. You, it's very, you, know, you can make it out, and basically you can see it. And these are the first sources of ionization, and you will see how they evolve. Uh, now it's a bit delicate. Did it work? Yes. So you start seeing that the, these re regions around these first galaxies get carved out with ionization uh, uh, radiation, and this ionization radiation increases. The number of sites where you have these ionizations happening increases. 
And it's a slow process, relatively, but, but uh, bit by bit, it fills the whole universe until it, it's, there's a percolation process here. You can describe it as a percolation process. Those of you who like the mathematics can, can describe this as a percolation, until everything ionizes. Uh, the, the, the blue stuff is, 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 is ionized stuff, basically. Uh, and you will see the galaxies at the end appearing as, as points, you know, kind of white points. Uh, but this is the process. Uh, now, we don't know a lot of details. So these are the galaxies that did the whole thing. Now you can see them. That's how it started. And that's the universe that we are left with. Uh, uh, left with. Uh, we, we don't know. Let me just run it again so that you can appreciate it. Um, we don't know exactly what are, how fast this process is, what's the, you know, how efficient these things are, because you produce UV photons uh, at, at the star's level, but for these UV photons to go out to the intergalactic medium itself and, uh, and ionize things, it, it, it needs to escape. There is something called escape fraction, which is a whole can of worms that people don't really understand. How much of this fo these photons go out, what's their fraction, and, and uh, uh, so th this will set up how, will decide how much of this uh, uh, we will see. Um, uh, what's the efficiency of star formation at these modes of forming stars? Also, we don't know. So this is, you know, kind of a, 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 an educated guess, but there's by no means something certain, right? Uh, the, the, the time, there's a time, there's normally they put a redshift somewhere, and they tell you this is, will take a rich, two, two redshift bins or something like that, but don't believe any of that stuff. We really don't know. Okay? Questions so far? Am I hitting the right level of things? Are people following or I'm too simple? Fine? People satisfied? Raise your hand if you are happy. Okay, good. Oh, oh that's, that's huge. Yes, please. Yeah. Well, it, it, I, they, the, 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 now let me, the, let me remember. I can't remember exactly what the red is. Uh, the, I think it's the, it's the range of temperatures that you have in that gas after it's ionized. So it, initially it heats up, but towards the end it kind of gets cooled, and you can see that it's cooled. That's my recollection. This is old, old thing, so I apologize if I didn't answer it correctly. Okay, so now I move to more. Yes, please. No, no, I mean, I, this is not what I, I said. We don't think it is the main source of ionization. It can, absolutely, it produces a lot of UV and it can ionize its surrounding. But if you go through the numbers of how many halos with this mass, and uh, that will become, uh, it doesn't add up. Right? But it, they might be the, you know, we might have surprises. And actually, there are indications that we might we, are, we have surprises, but uh, but they are not completely clear. Uh, this is I'm telling you what's the conventional wisdom, but whether whether this is true or not, it's not clear yet. This is an open field, so many of these things are not certain. Uh, okay, so now I move to uh, observational things, and uh, to talk about uh, uh, more questions before I move to this. Is it fine? Okay. So, uh, so there's lots of, uh, lots of observational probes, and I'll start with, with observations that we already know, uh, and what, that we already kind of learned something from. Uh, and you will see it's, it's, uh, it's not much, but it's improving a lot, and in the future we'll have much, much more handle on this whole process. Uh, there's, it's, a, it's a long laundry, you know, it's a long list. I'll start with the CMB, actually. You heard about it. I'll go a little bit into detail why the CMBs can tell us anything about reionization. So that's, that's the first thing, a little bit in terms of the physics of the CMB. Uh, I'll, today I'll tell you a little bit about the Lyman alpha absorption systems, how, how they teach us about, uh, about uh, reionization, Lyman alpha emitters. And uh, probably I'll start talking about the first galaxies, uh, sorry, the high, the high redshift galaxies. Uh, that, that are, uh, or also that's something that has been very active in the last decade, uh, less actually. Uh, and, uh, but there's lots of other things that one can talk. Uh, so I'll focus first about the CMB and these things, and later I will talk a lot about the 21 centimeter emission. Right. Okay. Uh, 
No, I'll, this shouldn't be here. This should be somewhere else. I'll, I'll, I'll move it later to somewhere else. Right, so let me start with the CMB. Why the CMB tells us anything about reorganization, right? Uh, so that's, that's the, 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 few, uh, the few slides that, that will come. This is an old topic, as you can see from the pap papers. Some of them go back to 1994. Uh, uh, but most of, uh, uh, this is where most of, I think this paper where most of the physics is laid out quite nicely. Uh, there's another nice review. And uh, the results are, so this is the theory, and the results have been coming in recent years, especially with WMAP and recently Planck. Um, uh, and uh, here how, I mean, this is a schematic picture. Uh, now this is kind of uh, uh, the opposite picture that you see. The Big Bang happens at this, at this uh, at circumference of this, of this, uh, of this circle. Uh, this is the last scattering surface, right? This is where we start seeing the CMB. And photons from here come to us. And then when come to us, they come to us, most of the universe, as we said, is neutral until you, they, we start ionizing the universe at low redshifts. When you ionize the universe, you have free electrons. Free electrons do interact quite effectively with photons. Thomson scattering, basically. It's a very simple process. Uh, uh, so from reionization to us, there is additional scattering of these photons. This additional scattering is, leaves imprint on the CMB kind of measurements. It's a secondary process. It's not primordial. It doesn't happen here. It happens on the way of these photons to us. That's why we call it secondary. But it happens. And that's why we can, from the CMB, say something about reionization, because it tells us something about where this happens. Of course, this is the wrong picture. This depicts things happening suddenly here at the reionization. Reionization doesn't happen suddenly. It happens uh, gradually, etc. But this is the picture. And it turns out that it, influence, it influences things uh, 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 Right, so, so this is, uh, you, you have seen something like this in the lectures of the CMB, so I don't need to go to too much details. But the dominant, the dominant uh, contribution happens uh, uh, it's basically uh, due to uh, Doppler shift of the scatterers. So you have an electron that is moving, and you have the CMB photon coming, and the fact that they interact, it, it basically scatters the photon and changes it changes its temperature a little bit, so you see some fluctuations in the, in the temperature. And this is the, this is the equation. Uh, that's the Doppler kind of effect of the temperature. This function is called the visibility. I don't know if you have, uh, if you have uh, seen it, in the, which is basically the, the optical depth of, for Thomson scattering uh, multiplied by the velocity. Right. So this is the process. Uh, I think this is the, the mathematics is nice, but but it's the intuitive understanding is the important one. Is the fact that you have scattering of, of of photons, it destroys their coherence because they scatter. So that's that's the main effect. So let me show you. Uh, so this is the visibility function that I mentioned that go into this calculation. But again, this is not the. It's interesting if you want to know the details, but the physical picture is very simple. The physical picture is as follows. And these are the two things that, you've, that I will uh, describe. So the physical picture is as follows. You have the CMB. The CMB we see through this uh, power spectrum, which has these kind of uh, power, uh, power at different uh, scales. These are coherent. Uh, because you have power at different scales, it means that you have coherence uh, of, of, of fluctuations at certain scales, right? Otherwise, the coherence destroys. There's no correlation at these scales. Now, if you have photons that scatter a lot before they arrive to you, that coherence is destroyed because they don't come to you, all of them. Some of them scatter there. Some of them. And if the process is very efficient, most of them scatter, that will destroy the whole coherence. So you should not see the CMB as we see it. So this figure is an old figure from Sugiyama 1995, who uh, uh, was one of the pioneers of this. And he shows the power spectrum that we now all uh, know and love as a function of how much optical depth for Thomson scattering there is on the way. In other words, how many free electrons on the way of the CMB 
to us this photon C. Okay? So, and it starts from zero, which means no, no reionization whatsoever. The universe is neutral until now. And this is what you should see, which is roughly what we see. Now, if you go to half, you will see that the coherence is getting destroyed. It means the amplitude is going down. It doesn't happen at the largest scales because this is beyond the, 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 the causality scale, right? The, the, you know, the, the L, of, L of 200, that's where the, 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 the light horizon at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at recombination. So that's not affected at all. These are happen at, at, at causal kind of things. Uh, but you can see that the coherence gets destroyed. In other words, the amplitude goes down. And, and the smaller scales affected more than the large scales. If you have larger and larger and larger, and I'd look at, at two, if you have things that are completely unionized, this will suppress completely these fluctuations. The CMB would look like this. So the fact that you see, don't see this, means the universe has very little new ionized have very little f free electrons on the way from the last scattering surface to us. It tells us one thing. That's the first thing you learn from the CMB. Uh, that's almost nobody mentions normally, which is taken for granted. The first thing you learn from the CMB, that the universe became neutral at some stage. That's the first lesson from the CMB. Right? It also teaches that about reorganization. But the first thing, because you see this, it means... This, these effects are very little, right? So the universe became neutral at some stage. So that's a very important bit. <laughs> the second thing, uh, so, so we are not at these levels. Absolutely not. Now, what happens if the level of ionization is smaller? So you go from this range of 0 0.03. This is from, uh, I, sh I forgot to give the credit. This is for Anthony Lewis here. It's, it's a, I should give him the credit for this, uh, for this uh, figure. Uh, this goes from very low tau to very large tau. Low tau means low uh, number density of free electrons on the way, and large tau is larger. It's still not very big. I mean, it's nothing compared to these numbers. And you can see that the shift, there is a shift. So this is the influence of these ionizing photons on the amplitude of the CMB fluctuations, right? The temperature fluctuations. I haven't talked about polarization yet. Okay? So you should expect an effect on the amplitude of the fluctuations. So that's the first thing. Now, these things do more. Why do they do more? Uh, now, let's kind of uh, make this, uh, this, uh, this model a little bit more uh, simplistic. Let's assume that you had the uh, last scattering surface from here, that the photons come, and then suddenly they see a cloud at rate of 10 of ionized stuff. Then you can write this visibility function that I talked about before as, as this combination. It's the, it's the probability of transmission. Uh, so the photons that come from here will kind of continue. That's the probability that they continue, plus the, the scattered stuff, right? So that's the, that's the photons that come from here scattered into our directions, etc. So that's, the, that's a picture that we can live with. Uh, and we can calculate all kinds of simple things here. Uh, but you can see that this term that comes from here is very negligible. These are the photons that are scattered from the CMB. They, they were coming in that direction, and then they hit this ionizing, ionized stuff, and they w came to us. Right? So this is very small. So that means that this ionization stuff is not that, that large. So that's another kind of way of saying the same thing. Now, let's look at polarization. So ionization should reflect itself in the temperature fluctuations. Now we'll talk about the polarization itself, which is much more sensitive. That's why people, as you can imagine, because people mention, mention the, the, the tau in the same breath when they talk about polarization. So normally, the CMB is polarized. Why is it polarized? Anybody knows? Because it's Thomson scattering, right? If you have a little bit of polarization before, it will stay, remain polarization. It, it polarizes. It kind of maintains polarization. Any scattering process 
produces polarization, scattering of light over water, right? That's why you, why you need your Polaroid glasses to, uh, to reduce that kind of uh, uh, polarization. So uh, anyway, so that's, that's, that's uh, scattering processes produce progress, or at least am amplify them. Uh, normally, when you talk about polarization, there are, I go, now I'm throwing you back to your electromagnetic uh, course, uh, there are four Stokes parameters, if you remember. Uh, we, we normally talk about Stokes parameters. The first one is the total intensity. That's the normal Stokes parameter. That's Stokes I, what they is called. And then there are another three. There's Stokes Q and U that are linearly polarization, polarized. And then there is Stokes V, and that's circular polarization. Circular polarization we will neglect here. It's not important. It's, it happens in certain circumstances, but mostly we'll neglect when people talk about polarization in the CMB, actually they don't measure the circular polarization. There's nothing that measures it. They only measure linear polarization, and, which means Q and U. And Q and U have different symmetries. Uh, at 90, so this one looks like this, this one looks like this. At, if you if, rotate by 90 degrees, you get this, uh, this symmetry in, in both, and if you rotate in 45 degrees, you, you do this symmetry. And uh, normally there is the polarization angle defined, defined in this way, and the uh, polarized intensity, what they call polarized int intensity, this P, which is the amplitude of square root of Q squared plus U squared. That's basically the amplitude in the polarization. So this is what, what we use normally. If you go to radio astronomy, which I'll mention later, these are the, number, the parameters they use. CMB, they decided to use something else. Let me uh, do it here. What they do in the CMB, they take a combination of Q and U and form things that are called E and B polarization. Uh, they are simple, kind of, they are linear transformations of these Q and U. What they do, they reflect symmetries. The, the, you combine Q and U to form E in such a way that if you put a mirror on front of your universe, make a parity transformation, it looks exactly the same, right? The B mode, is the opposite. It's, 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 it, it, it's, it's the, you know, the, the symmetry is, is, it changes, changes direction. So the sign changes, right? So you can f form these types of uh, things. Why they do it? Because of practical reasons, not because of fundamental reasons. Uh, so this is, I, uh, I took this, I think, from Wayne Hu's uh, webpage. I think this is an old thing. Uh, so if you have uh, two waves coming to a scatterer, this is the electron in the electron frame of reference, the electron moves up and down. When you scatter, so, uh, you know, if it moves like this, it will keep this in this mode, it will go up and down like this. Now, if you, uh, 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 if you come from this side, now I think, it, I don't know why it doesn't have it, but anyways, so now imagine you have another wave coming from this side, that does this, uh, and this one would also kind of have scatter over the same photon, it will produce something, uh, something a little bit different. So this direction, if it's a little bit different than this direction, the combined thing that comes out from the scattering will be uh, different, it will be a combination of both. So if this is different than this, you will get something that's polarized, right? So that's the simple Thomson scattering. Uh, okay. Now, uh, E and B modes, I talked about them. They, they, there's the R, this is how they produce them. I will not go into this too much. Uh, so the, in the B mode, there is a parity flip. In the, in the E mode, there is no flip. Now, if you look at, the, uh, at, uh, at recombination, let's assume that this is the horizon scale of recombination. We know what's the horizon scale at recombination. It's almost one degree, right? It's the L of 200. It's one degree. All of these processes that I'm talking about, you know, scattering, Thomson scattering produces polarization. That would happen within the, within the you know, causal, causal distance, right? Time scale. So at recombination, I shouldn't see any polarization above, well, well, I will see decay of polarization at scales larger than one degree. Otherwise, at Ls that are smaller than 200. 
because they are not causally connected. So there is no connection between the polarization there and the polarization there. Right? So if there is no, if there is no, there's nothing else other than the last scattering surface at Richard 1100, the scale at which I should see fluctuations in the polarization is L of 200 and below. In other words, larger Ls, smaller scales. But not above, because the above scales are not causally connected. Ah, I took that one out. Right. So I, I'll make a mishmash a little bit to show you the point I'm trying to make. This is a famous picture from WMAP. Uh, these are a number of different power spectra. I'm sure you have seen something like this, right? Power spectra of EE and TE. Did they, did they Paolo, or uh, not yet? Did they see power spectra like this? Yes, okay. So if you look at the EE mode, that's the E mode polarization power spectrum. That's the green one. You should see that. So this is the primordial expectation from the last scattering surface. You see here fluctuations, fluctuations. But here, you should see something that drops to this direction. Instead, we see this point, which is at L of a few, which means that we are seeing polarization happening at much larger scales. So either there is something in the fundamental physics of of this, these things that we don't understand, or the one degree on the sky, one degree is here, right? To remind you, that's the one degree. That's the peak. That's the L200. After L200, it should decay because you don't have causal connectivity. There's, they, are, you know, they are far away from each other. They don't know about each other polarization. But suddenly, you had this, this measurement here, right? What does that mean? So now I'll go back. It means that the scale at which we measure, that, that we measure is not this. It's much larger. But, but it cannot be larger than the horizon scale. Therefore, it has to be at a different time. It cannot be at the last scattering surface. It must be much, much closer where the horizon has increased a lot to produce fluctuations on these scales. This is why we get this very small effect at very small L's, because the horizon later, not at the recombination, at redshift 10 or 20, is much larger. The number, you know, 30, 40 degrees, rather than one degree. Yeah? Uh, so what we measure is not the horizon scale at recombination, but the horizon scale at, or the fluctuation scale, if you want, at, at reionization. That's why this measurement is important. Uh, okay, so these are uh, simulations that show you the very low multiples. So if you go back to this, normally this is the L of 200, it's here. Now we are going to below 10, from 50 to 10. It's this that we should get, right? So let me go back. So this is the CMB itself, the primordial CMB. But if you have tau that is between 0 0.04 and 0 0.08, these are the colors. So this is 0 0.08, this is 0 0.04. This is the effect of ionization on the CMB. So it's only in this very, very low L mode that you see this effect. That's why, for instance, uh, such small experiments in CMB cannot see this. They need, you need a very large scale, whole sky, right? That's why... Only Planck WMAP can produce this stuff. <clears throat> there are two effects there. One is the amplitude. The more tau you have, the more free electrons you have, you have a larger effect uh, versus the, you know, the 0 0.04. But there's another effect, which is a little bit more subtle, which is where the peak is. The peak moves from right to left. You see it. Right? It also has to do with the scale when ionization happens. So we learn something about it when, from when it peaks, if we can model this kind of uh, upturn very, very well, we can learn a lot. This is a simulation. This is the effect on the polarization. 
This is the effect on the cross power spectrum of TE. So this is the EE, the E mode polarization, this is the TE. Okay. Another thing, which this is from Planck paper. This is from last Planck paper, which gives this surprising result, but this is all simulations so far. And the, the gray area here, there is, the, is, the, is basically the uncertainty, the cosmic variance, basically. Right? So if you, I don't know if you can see the gray area, but there is a gray area. Okay. This is a word of warning, which all knew, we all knew for a long time, but, this is, uh, but the Planck people did a very nice job in demonstrating it. This is a number of different reionization scenarios. You can see this. There's one that happens almost suddenly. This red one raises and then a little bit more later. That's, this bit is the helium thing. Right? If, I mean, we are talking about hydrogen alone, but there's helium. Helium ionizes later, fully ionizes later, because it needs much more energy for the second electron to ionize. The first electron ionizes almost immediately, but the second one takes time. This is another uh, kind of scenario where things ionize, recombine, and then ionize again. All kinds, of, uh, all kinds of scenarios, right? All of them, you see them? When you calculate their power spectrum, they kind of almost lie on top of each other. The CMB cannot tell us the details. It's an integral constraint. It tells us basically how much of this scatters when it comes to us. How it scatters, it scatters here or here, we don't know. Okay? So when they tell you the redshift of ionization from CMB is 7, there is an assumption there. And the assumption is about the history of reionization. They tell you it's a sudden reionization or, or kind of gradual. Or, there is an assumption. It's a big assumption there. You actually can produce this by having a very low level of ionization from redshift 100 to 0. You get the same result, right? There's no problem. You can think about models like this. OK. So, uh, WMAP. So I'll, I'll, I think I'll finish with WMAP and Planck. I was planning to go more, but uh, I spent too much time on these things. <clears throat> so WMAP, the first WMAP result that came, it was 2004. And in 2004, three, something like this, they claimed that tau that they measured was 0.17. 0.17 was huge. It was unbelievable. And of course, like, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, like in every other field, theoreticians can explain everything. And there were lots of papers explaining this 0.17, uh, except that people kind of started, mm, this, is, this, is, this is not right. There's something <laughs> not, not right with this. Turns out that, uh, that uh, they, they had some problems. I mean, immediately, almost a year or two after that, they, they reduced this number to 0.09. First point zero, so there is a trend. They started for 0.11 and then 0.09 and then 0.085, 88, something like this. Uh, the reason is this is a very difficult measurement. When you do CMB, and I'm sure you have heard this, there is foregrounds that you have to clean. In total intensity, in the temperature, uh, these foregrounds are much more, hand, you know, there's, they, underst well understood than in polarization. Polarization, the sky looks crazy. Uh, the, the, the galaxy doesn't appear at the center alone. There is these huge arms of things, one, something called the North Polar Spear that goes from B of zero, you know, the, cent the galaxy of the center up. In the it's, it's a very different game. Also, they had some systematic issues in the data. Uh, so this, is the, the, this was the best estimate until recently. But Planck then started getting uh, results. And uh, Planck... Uh, they have very funny names, lolibob. Uh, th that means low L likelihood uh, something probability. And I think these PO were, uh, were added to have lollipop in the, in the acronym something. But it's, it's their pipeline, basically, of producing stuff. Uh, for instance, this VHL, that's the high, the high L modes that comes from a different, so also from Planck. There's all kinds of things, but they, they produce this tau which is way too small. That's really small. Now we are going to the, so, so we started with 0 0.107, and uh, now we are at 0 0.05. It's almost didn't ionize until it shift six. I mean, then we are getting really uh, a problem. I was in a, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in a workshop on ionization in Munich, a month thing, and uh, so there's lots of discussion. And the running joke was, if we wait 10 years, we'll have negative tau. 
because of that trend, you know. So, so that's uh, which kind of <laughs> looks. Anyways, this is what tau is now. This is, this is the level of tau. It's very small. But notice the error bars. They're not that small. So two sigma effect can take you. These are, th I think they are one sigma. Two sigma effect can go, take you by, back to 0 0.07, 0 0.075, something like this, which will raise. So there is lots of uncertainty in this game. Uh, and again, this doesn't say much about the details. It tells us only about the uh, integral. Uh, and uh, if you take uh, certain reionization scenarios, uh, something that, so this is modeled like a, like a function like this, where ionization happens. Uh, so if you look at the neutral fraction, it goes like this, where the center is the reionization redshift, and this is delta z, right? So there's, they, they have some sort of model there. And they kind of constrain both. Uh, I'll tell you what the difference between the green and, 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 and blue in a second. So let's look at the blue. The blue tells us that the reionization redshift is about between 6 and 10. And, but the delta Z can be from 2 to 8. <laughs> it means you cannot constrain how, how, yeah, it can be very wide, right? Uh, uh, for both scenarios. The difference between the two is that the blue one has the data from the CMB alone. Uh, this one, the green, has uh, another prior in top. Prior in statistics means that you assume something, uh, information uh, th that you know. And the prior here was that ionization ends at redshift 6 by, uh, by, by construction. You see this, uh, this, uh, this flip, bip, flip here that says it, we, we ask it to finish at redshift 6. And it gives you this, uh, so it's kind of tighter constraints, but again, it's a, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh. okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, tomorrow I'll continue with Lyman Alpha. It took me more than I expected, I hope, but, but I hope I'm, you know, I care more about you understanding what I say than covering stuff. So, so I hope that's the right strategy, and I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, more questions? Any, anything before I finish? Okay, thank you.